So the uh, it's so it's out of our great pleasure to have a you that side. And then, uh, he uh, he got a PhD in the Cornell 2018, and then he and then became a postdoc at the Pemira from the 2018-2021. And he's now the uh, the postdoc fellow then Yushi Abai. And uh, Yudai had worked on the pretty broad topics and uh, including the dark methods and the neutrinos and uh, also the you know connections between the you know the astrophysics and the uh, beyond the standard model, and he has a uh, part of his background. He also, also the, belonged to the several experiments, uh, including Doom and Nick. And, uh, and then today, is actually, he's going to talk about the uh, uh, interesting frontier the using the uh, asteroid to probe the, you know, some fundamental physics. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. So thanks for the introduction. So today I will focus on the elusive universe at the precision part here. So the title is slightly different from the what's on the advertisement, but I think this is a cleaner way to organize the whole talk. So let me get into it. So I do uh, involve in a lot of projects, but to me they are all basically the three similar projects. Oh yeah. So all are uh, basically three simple topics that I want to understand better the neutrino, gravity, and uh, most of the, my focus is on understanding dark matter. And this is the thing that I have been thinking about for the past 10 years or so. And uh, I call them as the elusive universe because all of them interact rather weakly with the rest of the center model particle. And, but they also have huge impact on cosmology, as we learned, and on um, the evolution of the universe, for sure, and also the later, the astrophysics. So they are extremely important for particle physics, uh, astrophysics, and cosmology. Okay. And of course, we see this plot all the time, many times, but most of the things that we're actually studying today are belonging to the elusive universe, whether we're studying the dark energy, which is closely related to gravity or dark matter, or neutrino that doesn't show up on this pie chart that we all are very familiar with, but they are all extremely important. And I would say the focus of the modern particle physics and cosmology, a lot of them are to understand uh, this elusive universe. So today I will kind of present you a program to study all of them together with the precision tracking. Okay. So, uh, so this is the thing that I study most. I study the theory frontier, building a lot of models, interesting models. But recently I'm more and more interested in kind of a general way to search for this new physics and as model independent as possible. So you can get a lot of leverage in the intensity from here, meaning you put a lot of particles on target, right? That's the usual neutrino experience. Or at the precision part here, which I will introduce today, or what I mean by that. And for different people, it's slightly different meaning. But the goal are always the same to understand dark matter, neutrino questions related to gravity, and understanding also the underlying theory and the cosmology and astrophysics implication, because there's a lot of them. So there is a whole very exciting program that in order to probe this elusive universe. And uh, so for the precision frontier, today I want to say a few words about this renewed interest or renewed direction, including the ultra precision tracking of some of the most dangerous asteroids, including Bennu. I will talk about the all series Rex, that is a space mission that tracks Bennu. Uh, you, can, you can get a lot of leverage because of the, there's a space mission. And we will talk about how to study dark matter and cosmic neutrino. You can also think about some creative way to use this new generation of space quantum sensor, uh, including the deep space atomic clock. So kind of a crazy idea that we had is to put this deep space atomic clock on board of the Parker Solar Probe. 
and to search for dark matter bound to the sun. Now, this is obviously quite a crazy idea, but the hope is not just this idea, but hope to inspire other similar ideas that we can, or much better idea, to use this space quantum sensor to do fundamental physics. And IS is a wonderful place. I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, exciting suggestion. And um, yeah, and another hope is also to kind of bridge particle physics, planetary astronomy, and space quantum technologies. These three things are all very exciting on their own, but there are non-trivial connections that we can make to further understand fundamental physics. Great. And also, this is kind of like a state of art, our probe of general elusive universe and BSM, uh, beyond standard model. So we already found Higgs, and the energy frontier will keep going. But obviously, it's hard to build a new uh, collider. It's very expensive. But we can actually leverage the collider to study the intensity frontier, and also using the neutrino experiment to study the intensity frontier. And I want to show this plot just very briefly, just because these are just the achievement we already made. You see, we already have the intensity frontier, and we found neutrino, the free neutrino. In the precision frontier, we also understand gravity much better. The GR, the gravitational wave. So the next big target would be actually the dark matter. Of course, we already found dark matter, but we want to further understand its particle nature. So this is kind of like a very nice summary of how we can go in this direction. And theory is obviously very important. We want to still connect to string theory, gratification theory, and so on and so forth. And theory is also important in terms of leading this direction to go down, to find creative way to do that. And just a quick thing about what's the most exciting thing about intensity from here for me is that you can leverage RHC. So RHC is colliding, colliding in this way. So a lot of times we study the transverse production. So you could produce heavy particle in the transverse direction. But Oh, but kind of uh, cost efficient way is to actually build a detector in the forward region. So in the forward region, you can actually produce a lot of neutrino and dark matter, and you can study a lot of the neutrino in the neutrino experiment here. And here I show you some of the neutrino electromagnetic property. And by showing this, I really want to show you this one. So this is the muon neutrino charge radius induced by the loop. And as you can see here, the dune and this red curve can actually touch the center model based on our projection. So it is possible we can actually measure a new electromagnetic property for neutrino. And when will we be able to do it? Potentially very soon, because in this June, there will be a dune near detector prototype operating at Fermilab. So potentially, we will be able to measure the charge radius. So this is very exciting. And if we actually measure it, I'm sure I'll be back to talk about it. But uh, we'll see how the uncertainties are taken into account. But this is very exciting. And for the future, we should leverage LHC more. So even though it's so hard to build a new collider in the accelerator world, there is still a lot of excitement. And really there's a lot of connection also to the actual physics crowd. So just people like me and Kota and a lot of you guys, this is the very exciting thing to connect actual and particle. And there's a lot of both standard model and beyond standard model fundamental physics in the elusive universe we can study. Okay, so let me not digress. Let's get into the topic today. So the topic today is really to study the dark matter and precision astrometry, and actually the ultra precision astrometry. So we will combine the lesson that we learned from Vera Rubin and Albert Einstein. What do I mean by that? Um, so gravitationally, this is the only way that we have ever understand dark matter, right? So. For the dark matter, we understand we found dark matter in the galactic rotation curve, full cluster merger, large scale structure. A lot of you 
are very familiar with this, um, much uh, expert in this, and also the CMB. So these are the actual dark matter evidence from gravity, right? And going up in scale. But how about smaller scale, right? How can you actually understand dark matter in a solar system? Can we actually do that? So this is extremely challenging, as I will show in the next few slides. And this is basically what our activity is at this moment. So, so if we take a step back, of course, we understand all these very well. The rare rubin, we study the velocity and all that. But the point is that there is comparable amount of dark matter to the standard model particle, to the barium, or even a lot more dark matter comparing to the barrier. That's why you can use velocity. But the reality is inside the solar system, these are much less, right? So, so in the galactic level, the dark matter usually is more than barrier. Actually, sometimes a lot more, sometimes comparable. But in the, in the by the way, please interrupt me anytime if you have any question, yeah. Um, but inside the solar system, there is 18 order of magnitude to overcome. So how can you even possibly see the dark matter gravitationally in the solar system? Sounds impossible, right? If you just consider velocity. Uh, but we actually can go way beyond just the velocity. And that's when, and, and why is it important, of course, is because this is very important to study dark matter direct detection. Either if you want to study the wave light dark matter or particle light dark matter, if there is substructure, it's very important to know. And this is also important for CNUB study as well. If we can ever understand the profile of the CNUB to a certain degree, it will also help our direct detection. Okay. Of course, yeah, okay. So, so what should we do then? So we learn very simple things from uh, GR and Newtonian gravity. We all learned this uh, in high school. So because we have the anomalous precession of mercury, that's how we confirm general relativity, right? Of course, we know the one over R squared term does not give us precession for these closed orbits. And here I define A and B and semi-major, uh, sorry, this is a semi-major axis. Eccentricity is just how non-spherical the orbits are. There's many dynamics here, so uh, you're very familiar with this. Uh, so the anomalous precession is how we confirm general relativity. Okay. But if you actually have dark matter, let's assume an over density around the trajectory, this will actually induce a force that is proportional to R, right? You, of course, also have a force that is one over R squared, but this force doesn't matter. You can just drop it because this force is, first of all, uh, some will overwhelm this. We already discussed that a few slides ago. But secondly, this doesn't induce precession. So in a situation that you want to study something like a precession or a precision tracking of the trajectory, this doesn't matter. So what really matters is this term that is proportional to R. So what this is telling us is also that eventually when I set a constraint, is the constraint on the density near the trajectory, not inside. What's inside doesn't really matter. Good, good. And the precession, sorry, why not? Why is it inside like Gauss's law symbol? Yeah, I also will give you this. And this doesn't matter. Give you one over R square. But if you're within the, the mass density, the Gauss law would give you the linear term. Within, you're saying, you're saying things uh, around it. The one over R square is the field outside, so you have a point particle, and outside, that's what you experience as one over R square. But if you're inside of that, this is how it's of that. Gravitational potential scales linear. I think that's exactly what that's what the yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. So, I, what I'm saying is, oh, or maybe we divide inside differently. I'm saying inside is when you're completely enclosed. This, oh, 
maybe visually I can be clear. What I'm saying is that these two give you the same results. Do you agree? Up to this term. Yes. Right. So what I'm saying, what maybe your inside means near the trajectory. Yes, if it's near the trajectory, you have the R linear term. So what I'm saying is that when you're uh, when the trajectory is crossing the density, those are the terms that those are the density that matters. What's enclosed completely is what's not matter. What does not matter? Right. Yeah, and this is kind of useful later. I'll show you. And the induced precession, very interestingly, is proportional to a to the third, and of course also depending on the eccentricity. But this a is very important because later I will discuss and. You already all know. For general relativity term, the induced precession is one over a. So this actually encourages us to go to asteroids further away. Awesome. So who are observing these asteroids? So these asteroids are some of them are dangerous, and we also don't need to differentiate between asteroids and planets. Asteroids and planets are basically the same. Some are, but uh, planets are much heavier, but for fundamental physics purpose, they are the same. They subject to very different systematics, of course, but uh, from the fundamental point of view, you should try all of them. And there is millions of solar system object to be studied for many fundamental physics topics. And it needs theory and data expertise to realize the full potential. So I provided some particle theory expertise, but a lot of you more know a lot more than I do. So together, I think we can actually discuss a lot more exciting topic to be tested. And the data expertise is also something I'm not very good at. So this is also an area that we can expand into. You can, we can use all kinds of fancy uh, data analysis. The point is nobody is doing that. So. Uh, the tracking are provided by radar, so not the usual astro astrophysics observation. Those are usually radio, right? But radar give you actually the line of sight velocity and also the line of sight distance. So you have extra two, uh, two you have two extra uh, information that you usually don't have in astrophysics uh, observation, right? So radar is extremely important and. A receiver died, so actually that killed a lot of these uh, bills. So right now I try to revive it, that people uh, start to care about this again. And you also have the optical one, this is the pen star. So pen star also can track these asteroids very precisely. And uh, more importantly, well, not more importantly in the fundamental sense, but in the more um, topical or uh, trendy, and I, sh I shouldn't say trendy, more um, kind of uh, timely sense that you have also a lot of space missions that are tracking these asteroids. For example, one of them is this Osiris Rex. Uh, I will talk about more, but in the future, you can imagine a lot of these space missions tracking all different asteroids to give us a network, kind of like post-star timing array, but we can have an asteroid network to study all these fundamental physics. Right. And why? It's because these are dangerous, right? So this is one of the events hitting Russia, and a lot of people had to seek medical attention in 2013. And you know, Russian people, they have to search for medical attention. It usually means it's very serious for anyone, not just Russian. Anyone. Exactly. So, tracking actually is important to our safety for any nation, uh, people in all nation and uh, animals and animals. Uh, so we have a space mission like Osiris Rex to track these dangerous asteroids, and the NASA plan is actually once the tracking is done. These will then fly to apophis to track apophis. So you actually have another very good data. And actually, it's very exciting for the Osiris that it will return the sample of the asteroid. So we will actually learn value better. And who knows what's on the asteroid, right? Maybe there's alien. Uh, I mean, what's Bennu? I don't know. Bennu is one of the, yeah, that's a great question. Bennu is one of the dangerous asteroids that could hit us roughly 100 years from now. Actually, in the year, 
I just looked it up so I remember in year 2135, there's a close encounter. And the closest to Earth is 170 ish kilometer. So it's quite near, not that near. The uncertainty that they determine is roughly speaking 3,000 kilometers. So 100 years from now, we can know roughly the value, the, the distance to the precision of 1,000 kilometers. So it's really high precision tracking, right? So this is very impressive. This is actually done by my collaborator, Davide, which I will show. But there is another one that is visiting us very soon. I think in 2029, the Apophis, yes. Apophis is visiting us very soon. So this is also potentially dangerous. And you, if you don't trust them, right? What if it actually hits us? So to me, one of the projects that I'm doing is actually to get one of their older version of the code to actually do some of this fundamental study myself. And you can also account for some accident. I'll talk about it later. Yeah, please. So beyond Earth, though, I was told that there was some kind of fortunate situation where Jupiter uh, intercepted a lot of these. So do you also yes. track intercepts? Yeah, so uh, if you mean intercepts in terms of uh, what specifically interception? Like you're worried about close encounters with Earth, but the claim is that Jupiter gets hit all the time. Jupiter gets hit by the asteroids all the time. Yeah, I think Jupiter is a interesting, it, it's heavier. And also Jupiter actually showed us from a lot of these asteroids for some reason. I think there is, I was trading with uh, uh, Matt yesterday. So, so there is something that some asteroids can actually come into the location where Earth can be. But because you have Jupiter, these asteroids will actually be fling out by the Jupiter. Mm -hmm. So Jupiter is actually protecting us. Yeah. Um, uh, so I see. So it's more deflective. It's not a collision. Yes, but but obviously I there's some a lot of things I haven't thought about. So the the the, the more complicated effect should be think about more. But what I'm saying is that uh, for the topic today, all the Jupiter effects are completely taken into account. Those are easy to take into account because we know where they are. But these more stochastic things that sometimes you attract new things, for example, maybe you have interstellar objects, those are things we have to worry about because those are new perturbations from outside of the solar system. But those are very cool topics that we can actually explore. Okay. So speaking of the, this uh, pre prediction, it's done by uh, Davide Fanucia, my uh, collaborator. He is the actual Earth protector. Uh, he actually uh, studied these and actually have to predict things far away from now. And the, he, takes, he takes into account all the planetary ephemerites, and actually we will vary the planetary ephemerites to estimate uncertainty. So ephemerites are produced uh, in different years, sometimes produced by Russia, sometimes produced by US, they all have great tracking. So you can actually vary the ephemeris to actually know the uncertainty. There is big uncertainty from the small body perturber, but we have to take into as many of them. Now, the number is not the uncertainty. The uncertainty is the mass of the small body of perturber. Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, I mean, maybe we'll get to this, but uh... How does the uncertainty of the masses influence of these objects compare to the, the, to the mass of the dark matter? Right. Right. That's a great question. So yeah, I will get into that. But uh, please remind me if I didn't specifically answer that. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I'll get into that. There's also, of course, relativity effect. These are easy and the blindness of the Earth. These are small. There's also many other things. I'm uh, making it very gray here because if you want to, if we get into that, there will be too much discussion. But happy to discuss all the other perturbation after the main discussion. Okay. So you have this is just part of the very compli like complicated code. But then we add this very simple term into this complicated code, and we also discuss all these gray out uncertainties in the in our paper. But some of these are very exciting, for example, not, not very exciting, very interesting. For example, the Yakovsky effect 
is the uneven heating of the asteroid. So you have the solar heating, and then not just heating it, but also you will have radiation. And because the asteroids are spinning, you will have this heating plus emission, you will actually push it to a certain direction. Another thing that's interesting is, yeah, I'll talk about another thing that's interesting. How many bodies are you summing over in this? This sum is from J equals one to some large number. How large is that number? Right, so that is depending on, so, so that is, uh, so definitely 340, yeah, 243 is the small body and uh, of course the usual planets, yeah. Great question, yeah, thanks a lot. What's the dominant uncertainty amongst this? this? It's a small body uh, mass, is this one. Dominating uncertainty is we don't know the mass of these uh, objects very well. It's hard to measure them, right, yeah. And we also don't know the composition of them very well. So most of them are very uncertain, whereas some right. of them are probably not known. Some of them are known better for sure, but uh, you see um, the larger one will be more important. So, but yeah, some of them are known better. Yeah, I, 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 you're right. I'm not saying all of them are the same order. Some of them provide larger uncertainty. It's just a small subset of these, but those provide the worst uh, uncertainty. Yeah, the, the uncertainty on some of these major ones provide the most uncertainty. Yeah. Okay, so here's our results. So currently we can constrain, these are both planets and uh, asteroids. So for Bennu, you can constrain 10 to the sixth order of magnitude above the galactic average. So it's still way high. And for Apophis, it's 10 to the um, eight-ish order of magnitude higher than the galactic average dark matter. So the structure is very high. And related to what we're discussing, it's, it's actually radius dependent because it's basically the constraint on the dark matter near the trajectory, not something inside. So you actually constrain the profile. So you have a dependence. So Saturn, Jupiter, and these. And there are a few features, let me get through them. So we're comparing to 0 0.3. So actually people told me now it's more like 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So it can be slightly modified, but it doesn't affect the results. And here I plot the near Earth objects, but you can extend to many other asteroids. You have Manville, you have many other asteroids. So we should study all of them. And the X axis, there is this, then these are not the uncertainty, these are the coverage based on the eccentricity, right? Uncertainty is not that large. Uncertainty is much smaller, but these are the coverage of the bound because these are uh, a eccentric. So the bound will be, for example, this is highly eccentric. So the bound will be from, let's say this is one AU, this is five AU. So the bound will be covering a larger regime if you're highly eccentric. So, so, and you can see some of these bluish, purplish dots. These are not a proper analysis. These are estimation based on the previous UCLA study. So previously UCLA studied nine asteroids before a receiver of die. They studied nine asteroids considering, not, not for dark matter, but they consider general relativity. So I found a way to recast their general relativity bound into dark matter bound. And this is their coverage. So we're very excited in terms of analyzing this ourselves to get the proper bound. Yeah, but you can see these are actually comparable to Bennu. So it kind of reinforce our uh, confidence in analyzing this. Of course, I should be more confident than ben in Bennu, but the fact they are in the same order is very assuring. Yeah, actually I should say, we make their result more believable because our analysis is much, much more involved than theirs. So in the classic cold dark matter scenario and you collapse the substructure and all that, what is the typical density over density? Not this, so if it's really typical dark matter, it's hard to say how big it is, but the, the formation mechanism that I know, I know of is, for example, you have a cold formation, right? So you have the sun that is deepening the potential is deepening in real time. So you have this adiabatic contraction. Those are only ordered one. 
So those are the minimal ones. So the minimal you have order one enhancement. To have such a huge one is have to be some exotic model. Yeah, normal ones could never give you that. But but even a normal one can give you this kind of structure, but not necessarily surrounding the Earth. They can give you this kind of cuspy profile, right? And you can have cuspy substructure, but usually you will have like it passing through Earth. But as long as the passing time is in year level, you can actually still detect it. So this program is very versatile to do many things, but we choose the simplest one to them. And if you just choose the simplest uh, assumption of spherically symmetric distribution, this is the thing you get. So it doesn't look that impressive, but if you consider we overcome eight, we have to overcome 18 order of magnitude. And we already gone to six to uh, four to six order of magnitude. This is still very impressive. So we actually overcome 12 to 14 order of magnitude, right? And that's all because of the extreme precision tracking of these solar objects. Then you have the uh, trajectory and not just the average velocity, right? But obviously I'm not satisfied with this, so let's keep going. So what are the implications? So the first implication is of course, and you probably heard about the third one, there is this solar basin idea that if you have some dark photon, you can be generated in the sun and there can be things accumulated in the solar system. This is done by uh, Ken Van Tilber and collaborator, and Ken was a, a postdoc here in IAS. So we can actually set a constraint on solar basin. I haven't worked on it, but the interesting thing, oh, one thing I want to mention is our bound is pure gravitational. So if you have any other interaction, you could expect to have much larger <coughs> effects, right? So that hasn't been studied yet properly. So I'm working with Kota and other people. If we have any dark matter cell interaction, this bound can be much more relevant, even for like electric dark. Great. And then also apply to solar basin because those models have to be produced by the sun. So it means that the dark matter itself has certain interaction with the sun. So it should affect the asteroid more so strong, stronger. And there is also XL mini cluster. Here I plot one of the more exotic model, which is very exotic. They have huge over density. This is something called solar halo. It's basically a soliton or bound state of this ultra light dark matter bound to the sun. And again, oh, actually, let me, if I didn't explain the y axis, well, let me explain the y axis. The y axis is the over density comparing to the galactic average. So the galactic average is the starting curve, and all of these are the constraints on the over density. So, um, yeah, so there is this crazy, uh, not crazy, uh, exotic one that has huge over density. So we can definitely set constraint on this huge over density one. But those are more extreme. Those are saying that this, this kind of model, the assumption is because you have external potential from the sun, you potentially can form a structure that can be supported by the potential if you solve the equation. So if you just naively solve the equation, this is the maximum amount you can squeeze in, given the planetary constraint. So the planetary constraint is already imposed. I haven't imposed the asteroid one. The asteroid ones are not important for the Apophis and Bennu for here, but these uh, blue ones will become important. So we're actually cutting into a lot of this parameter space, but this needs proper analysis. So I'm not imposing them, but these ones can be constrained. This is saying that what's the maximum amount you can support with the earth or with the solar gravity, and you can have a huge amount. But obviously there will be a lot of issue of the formation and how to sustain this huge amount. Those are not the, I'm not, uh, getting into any of this discussion. All I'm saying is that a lot of these more exact model, we can set strong constraint. So that's the first thing. Secondly, you can set very strong constraint. There was a question like for this uh, solar model, like, I mean, from what Ken predicted, it seems like the density is just like GeV per centimeter, like uh, even like 0.01 GeV per centimeter cube. 
point oh one. Sorry, like it, it didn't reach that high as you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. You are considering this is different. Additional right? things. Yeah. This is different. yeah, this is different. No, no. This is not the. This is not the it's solar different. base. This is a solar halo thing. People pr- propose. This is two solar different. Basin, you also mentioned why was it? Yeah, solar basin. We're not solar basin doesn't have such a strong over density, but solar basin has extra coupling to the photon. So hopefully those will increase the, the those not hopefully those will have larger effects on the asteroids. I just has to estimate what's the effect yet. But here is pure gravitational. I'm just comparing to the solar halo model, the red one. Yeah, yeah. Please. Um, can you comment on uh, how these constraints compare to what you get from like pulsar timing, which requires very precise knowledge of the ephemerity as well as the solar system optics as well? Yeah, that's a great point. So I want to have two comments. So first is uh, for the pulsar timing array itself, it is really relying on the planetary study as well. So planetary study, actually, I think the uncertainty of one of the planets provide a significant uncertainty for pulsar timing array. So hopefully my program can help that. So hopefully my program can help feed that mass and feed into pulsar timing array. So that's one thing. Secondly, I think an interesting question is, with the solar, uh, with the pulsar timing array, can we also study these kind of things? The answer is should be yes, but the over density might be higher, but it's still very interesting. I haven't done that, but it should be able to be done. And also because there's also huge data. Now, the, the, Challenge there is you usually don't have the whole orbits, right? But you have good timing. So the analysis will be different from what we do here, but still it's worth thinking because one, one thing you can at least think about is basically just using the orbital parameter in terms of the orbits itself. How long is the, the period? So just using the period, but because you have so many pulsar, it's possible you can gain some average. So that's I'm going. I, I, I thought about it a little bit, but haven't done too much. Yeah. Also the binary, right? So you can also use the binary to do that. But uh, I would say the constraint would be much weaker, but could still be interesting because they'll they'll be location dependent, right? Yeah. Thanks for the question. So another thing that is interesting is if you have long range interaction between dark matter and standard model, then basically what we consider also applies. But then now you can actually probe much stronger because once you have this long range interaction, usually because there's weak gravity conjecture. So this long range interaction is usually much stronger than gravity. So you, all you need is four order to six order of magnitude stronger interaction that you can already probe the galactic dark matter. So here I assume the dark matter is just galactic, but if my long range interaction is four to six order of magnitude, I can already set a meaningful constraint. But I haven't mapped out all the class of model here. So this is ongoing progress to consider all these class of model that have long range interaction between dark matter and standard model particle. So this is ongoing progress, not ongoing work. You know, already based on the weak gravity conjecture thing, just, uh, yeah, I just decided that what, what, what's the cost? Yeah, all I'm saying is that. Any interaction, right, between the dark matter and sound model, if there is no range interaction, because of a weak gravity conjecture, I don't know how much it implies, it has to be, this interaction has to be stronger than gravity. So, so what I'm saying is that because, because here I'm also considering the constraint is also on long range interaction. So this constraint can directly apply. And because if I have any strong interaction, I will immediately overcome this four order of magnitude. If I have four order of magnitude stronger, so uh, stronger dark matter than our interaction. So I can actually already probe galactic dark matter. Yeah. But the class of model, I haven't worked it out. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, I don't know. Yeah, this is not a test for weak gravity conjecture. I'm just saying the weak gravity conjecture tells you that this interaction has to be stronger. Are there no constraints on this? Six of those magnitude sounds like a lot. So this is not, this is long range, but not too long range or something like that. But this is not, this is very weak, right? This is compared to gravity. But doesn't the CMB already have? Yeah, but the, the baryons move in the, in, the, in the galaxy because of the force of the dark matter 
the gravitational force, right? It's what makes structure form and whatever, blah, blah, blah. And if you change this by many of the magnet sound effect. That's a good point. I need to think. Of, yeah. Yeah, there's probably already existing very strong so culture. The class, I don't know. Right. That's a good point. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying because we have a bullet cluster in pass by, if there is such an interaction, it should have a drag force. Construct. I mean, obviously, for the cosmology, you cannot change this by more than some tens of percent, I would assume. Right. Yeah. If it's really long, if it's operating in cosmological things, maybe you're right. I think. If it has a mass of a few of you, it's still, if this mediator, whatever it is, has a mass of a few of you, maybe there's some rooms, I don't know. Enough. There is some, I will show you a very related thing about this quickly, but yes, so if your mediator has a finite mass, that would uh, definitely be significant. I'll show you very soon. Yeah, but that's a good point, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. If I consider, you're right, if I consider purely long range force, the cosmological constraints are important. Yeah, I should specify that on the slide, yes. Absolutely right. Awesome. Okay, and now is the related to sinew B. So we can set a very horrible bound on sinew B, 10 to the 11 or, uh, over density. So this is comparing. So, so this is essentially the same constraint that I show you here, but I translate into a comparison to sinew B. And because we predict sinew B to be much less than dark matter, so our current constraint is roughly 10 to the 11 times higher than the predicted sinew B. And obviously, uh, Chris here is uh, wanting to search for the sinew B actually in the, the Ptolemy experiment, and that's very exciting. But here, even though it's super hard, we try to provide some way to say something about sinew B that actually is comparable to the best lab bound. So the best lab bound is by Catherine that is 10 to the 11 order of energy, higher than the average. Now, there's one interesting comment I want to make. Our constraints are different. They have a rate constraint. So the rate is 10 to the 11 over density in terms of number density. But for us, it's the energy density constraint. So you can translate this into a neutrino mass constraint, which is horrible. So, this may, we, I may win a Nobel Prize that I learned that the uh, neutrino mass is uh, smaller than 10 to 11 uh, EV, right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. But anyway, I don't think so, yeah. What a surprise. But anyway, so, uh, but hopefully, I mean, yeah, hopefully in the future we can improve the precision that we can reduce this because CUB is so hard to pass, so any kind of extra information we can have could be useful. And another thing is you have a profile, so you have a radial dependence. So you kind of so even we found a new CUB density in the Earth, that will be very exciting, and then we can know what's the other uh, in other location. But but that's also why I wanted to share with Chris to know maybe there are some other effects that I haven't taken into account. For example, I didn't really take into account any weak interaction but it doesn't seem to buy me that much. So that's uh, something I'm thinking about, but maybe there are some effects I haven't, think of, I haven't thought about for the planets or asteroids that could be useful in terms of testing sinew B. That's an ongoing uh, thinking. <coughs> okay, so this is a, uh, how long have I taken? Oh, yeah. okay, good. So uh, I will close very soon. So the idea is hopefully, so, so obviously I'm not uh, satisfied with this. So I want to be able to overcome this four order of magnitude. So the idea currently is that you can put this quantum sensor on board of two of the space mission. So then you can help the tracking. And you also don't just study the precession in terms of earth. You study this relative astrometry or relative precession between two planets or between one asteroid and one planet, that will be interesting. And we can increase the precision because the way that we learn the distance is by counting the time, right? So if you have atomic clock on board of two missions, then you can help the tracking of the distance significantly. And that's how they, why they are developing this deep space atomic clock is to help the navigation. So navigation is directly related to distance measuring. So 
Hopefully, we can actually overcome folder of magnitude in terms of precision. So where are, the, are you going to send the, these? Uh, Not yet. This is just a very rough idea. But that's rough idea. But you want to achieve this goal. Though, where should you should we send to this? Great question. So one should be on Saturn. The other one should be on asteroid near Saturn. Well, not necessarily near, but nearby asteroid. Because Saturn currently provides such a good concept because Saturn is stable, right? So Saturn can be tracked much more precisely and there's much less uncertainty. And the other one, maybe you can use Mars. Actually, Saturn and Mars would be good. Or Saturn and other asteroid. Depends on depends on we, we have to we can think about it actually. So what's the realistic one to send it to? But Actually, we should do it. Yeah, I haven't wrote a, read a paper about a realistic one, but this is actually interesting to think about which two because they have the ability to do that. They have deep space atomic clock already available. And they are actually looking for motivation to, to which mission they want to attach to. So actually, that's a great thing to, to discuss. So yes, you can increase the precision, but the bottleneck is still the uncertainty of the mass of this minor perturber. So the idea is you want to take into account all the millions of asteroids and fit their uncertainty. Okay, so let me go through very quickly the GR and FIT4 study. So I hope, uh, yeah. So this, these other two only have a few slides, so don't worry. So, so for the GR, we already- Why wouldn't you want to introduce your own masses that you could track precisely to integrate up other uncertainties? That's a great point, but usually the human-made stuff are too, have too much problem, right? So you have your own um, engine that causes the flyby anomaly is caused by this radiation of the engine. And also these are much lighter. So they are very subject to like solar wind, whatever other thing, or the Yakovsky effect. It's the wrong scale. Yeah, they are not stable enough. They are not a good test bed. Yes, yes. But still, this is still good. If you send it further away and you don't keep pushing it, that might still work. Right? If you send it to a general location and just let it flow, it might still work. That's also worth thinking about. But here, I just want to quickly mention the general relativity is 1 over A, and the best constraint is from Messenger. So hopefully we can help them improve their constraint because we can fit some of their uncertainty to fit into the messenger. So that's one of the ideas for the data analysis. I think with that, I can think of a very big line extended to your point to something like that. What would be this effect on Pluto's orbit? Yes, so do I not have Pluto? Maybe I don't have Pluto. Yeah, maybe I dropped Pluto. Pluto is the one which is the highest eccentricity, this one. Right, that's interesting. Yeah, we don't have Pluto here, so we should analyze Pluto. Yeah, Pluto probably maybe it's because it's too not massive enough, so the uncertainty is large. Yeah, I have to think about it. I haven't thought about Pluto that much. Yeah, but uh, let me say quickly. So previously, as I say, people studied nine asteroids, and they got a pretty good constraint for the GR, not for dark matter. They studied nine asteroids for the GR. There's a lot of complicated study that they did, but eventually they get to 10 to the minus four for this PPM parameter. So it's only one order of magnitude from the messenger. So hopefully we take into account all the asteroids in the, that we are available to us, you can already improve the GR constraint. That's the hope. But there's a lot of work to be done. And also you can do fit force. This is directly related to uh, uh, Matthias was saying. So here, this is not the dark matter standard model, the dark matter standard interaction. This is between standard model and standard model. So we have a parametrization, model independent parametrization, just comparing to gravity. So there is an alpha tilde. So alpha tilde in the level of minus 10 is what asteroids can do. And this is better than the Earth's constraint for this specific mass range. Because for this specific mass range, the mass of the uh, ultralight mediator corresponds to AU distance, right? Or a little bit nearer. So that's why they have the best constraint here. The constraint gets weaker in both to both direction, uh, because one you recover the non non non, uh, you recover the yeah. So it constraint become weaker in both direction. So so. 
So this is the basically responding to what you're saying. So yes, so even, so these are also hydro dark matter cinema model interaction. The mass of the mediator that is preferred has the same uh, length, distance, radius, right? The wavelengths will be comparable to the solar distance. That will be where you have the best constraint. Right. Any question? So you can probe a lot of different low range force model like Fuzzy dark matter, ultralight dark matter, LE minus L mu, LE minus L tau gauge theory. Some dark energy models are uh, very interesting uh, and it's comparable to many lab uh, experiments. What is the relation between this G and the alpha? Uh, alpha is usually what, yeah, this is precision. So this is the usually done by these. Um, Itovash people from Washington, they always parameterize things just based on gravity. But to me, this is not very meaningful because usually things are model dependent. So here we actually have a specified model that with the coupling is G between proton. This is a simplified model that we specify the model. So this is not important for us, but it's important for them because in this Itovash experiment, they are basically studying the equivalence principle violation. So the specific uh, mediator model is important for them because, oh, so there's one point I want to mention here. Asteroids are very strong in terms of probing the actual fifth force, right? They are not good at probing fifth force. They are good at probing the violation of the fifth force on the equivalence principle. So basically they are doing the modern day, uh, sorry, they're doing the modern day Galileo experiment of two different material and how are the gravitational effects affecting them differently. But we don't care about that. We care about the absolute fit force. So, so their constraint can be going away if there is a model that conserves the equivalent principle. But what I don't understand is uh, how come you can make a constraint without knowing there, there seems to be another parameter, which is the charges. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The charge is a G. So, but, but so the constraint must be a co combined constraint on G times the charge. Uh, is this assumed to be? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Charge is here. Yeah. Yeah. The charge is based on the, how, much, how many protons. For this specific plot, if, when I make this specific plot, the constraint is depending on how much proton are there in the sun and asteroid and times the juice of mass. It's just the mass. Yes, related to the mass directly. Yeah. And that's why I can make this kind of direct plot. But once you change a different model, our plot doesn't really change, but the constraint will change. The, the, the existing constraint will change because they are probing the equivalence principle violation. But, uh, our plot is, is just probing the actual alpha. Their plot is probing G. So, so, sorry, our method is probing alpha, their method is probing G. So there's complementarity. So they will move, but the alpha is always the same. But you can actually have a conversion once you specify the model between. Right, if you look at this plot, you're of course uh, probing alpha is much smaller, very tiny. Right. But on the other plot, you would say, oh, maybe we can have even a strong alpha stronger than one by fewer than the magnitude. possible. Uh, no, these are two different alpha. Yeah, I should, there is some mess up definition. These are not the two, these are not the same alpha. This is dark because this is, in, this, that one involves dark matter. The other no, one. no, no, the parameterization is messed up. I shouldn't use, I should use alpha. Sorry, I should use alpha, tilde, tilde. Uh, the other one, yeah, the other one is not just between, you see, this other one is a different parameterization. It's not a. It's not comparing to the G M M R square. So this alpha is defined differently. Sorry. So yeah. So this is much weaker. No, this is probably much weaker than this alpha. But I, I need to do a conversion. I need to do a conversion. Yeah. So five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Good. Five minutes is more than enough. So let me summarize. So. There is a huge amount of asteroid we can study. There is a near Earth subject and all these, uh, and also the extreme TNO and trans Neptunian objects. So we should actually study all of them. And in the future, oh, this is the most important slides that we learned the GR cast is proportional to one over A. 
The fifth force is proportional to A, and dark matter is proportional to A to the third. So our improvement is crucial to motivate to study asteroids further away from the sun. But of course, in order to take into account this data, the modern data analysis approach is important. But this also explains why people didn't really study anything other than Mercury, because Mercury is enough for GR tests. Right. So this is the most important slide. So I will not go into detail, but you can probe all these things with this uh, new data analysis. And finally, I just want to say one word about searching for ultralight dark matter. So there is this uh, cute idea. We say we say we can put this atomic clock on board of the Parker Solar Probe to go near the sun to study this solar halo idea I mentioned. And this will induce oscillation in the atomic clock. So you can use the atomic clock oscillation in the frequency to pick out this ultralight dark matter. That is the solar halo. And this is the result. So this is collaborating with the quantum sensor experts. So if you consider coupling to electron, for certain regime, if you can put this atomic clock on board of Parker Solar Probe, you can probe much deeper into the parameter space, you can touch the naturalness prediction and the uh, relaxation prediction. These are very hard to test. So the idea is, yeah, if you put this deep, deep space atomic clock on board of the Parker Solar Probe, you can go near the center to probe this uh, over density. And because this induces oscillation in the atomic clock frequency, so you can use atomic clock to study this kind of ultralight dark matter much better for this regime. The location of the, uh, the you have peak, this is just to associate with the distance from the sun to. Yeah, 0 0.1 AU. That's right. Okay, okay. So you can choose, right? Okay. You can choose. You can go nearer, but then you hit the corona and then things will be destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get into the corona, or you do if you want to study solar physics. Is it possible to put the atomic crop in yes. such a sensor small in the vicinity of the sun? It's possible, but you need new kind of clock. And that's why we, we are working with Mariana. You need solid state clock. Oh. You need stronger clock. The, the iron trap, all these clock using a laser are bad because they will be cooked right yeah. away. But the gen new generation clock, like solid state clock and nuclear clock are very useful. Actually, nuclear clock is something that they are developing that they can probe. The so here I have the electron coupling. But actually, what's exciting is you can also probe the gluon coupling. And those, you need nuclear clock. Right. So that's good. So I'm ending the talk. You can also study the variation of fundamental constant. Let's not get into that. So summary and now look. So currently, we can gain a lot of leverage already for the next generation one. So all series racks will go into all series apex. And DSEC1 will go into DSEC2, which is the Deep Space Atomic Clock 2. So we can utilize a lot of this space mission and put in quantum space, uh, quantum clock on board to study all of the fundamental physics topic I listed on the right-hand side. And there will be LSST that will have five times more asteroids that we observe, and also new space mission to go to the asteroids. So these are very exciting. And there are JWST, all these planetary data that maybe help us study God's monopole and things like that. So these are also great to study. And this is a team that uh, we're very proud of. I assemble, so I'm very proud of the team. And uh, yeah, so let me go to the summary plot. So before our efforts, I understand there were a lot of these study of general activity, modified gravity, and planetary deep and the solar physics. But we're hoping to build this precision lab for particle physics and cosmology. They can also study primordial black hole, topological defects, macroscopic dark matter, and interstellar objects, and also probably planet nine. And some of these are dangerous, actually, because when these things fly into the solar system, they can disrupt the asteroids. So these are extremely important to study properly, including the interstellar object. So these are more stochastic than what I studied. The, what I studied is more gradual effect. These are more stochastic. This could be more dangerous. And uh, yeah, so let's motivate us by Frederick Ryan. So Frederick Ryan said the reason why he wants to study uh, free neutrino is people say nobody can do it, and he, he did it. So 
It's also challenging to study solar dark matter, and it's very hard to do it, but motivated by Frederick, I think one day we can do it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. And uh, questions? So I, I guess I had missed during the pandemic that uh, this four mile air sepo steel structure had collapsed. What were your ideas? Were you thinking of having it be built as a, a drift scan telescope or something? Yeah, I, I actually don't know if there is any. Um, so there are plans to revive a receivable or build a better one, like a receivable first or next generation. I currently don't have, don't know the state of art, but we can certainly turn a lot of the radio telescope into radio telescope, a radar telescope, just by having an active radar. So that's one thing to do. So, for example, in, in China, there is a lot of these new, like fast, no, maybe it's not in China. So there's a lot of radio telescope. You can turn many of them into radar telescope. But a receiver is still the best. The design of a receiver is perfect for radar. So I still think the next generation radar telescope is very useful. And the, interestingly, in the US, the commu community of radar and uh, the usual astrophysics community is separated. The radar is actually in the geology department. So there's an interesting cultural thing. So I don't know what's uh, happening there. But my hope is, even though radar might be stuck, but optical one is improving drastically. So LST is improving drastically, uh, the, the number of asteroids we see. And uh, Gaia is actually helping the tracking of the asteroid very, uh, very significantly because they provide an all sky map for these uh, asteroids. So even though radar is stuck, we still have goldstone, but it's stuck. The optical one may improve a lot. And combined with space mission, we can still improve significantly. Thanks for the question. Yeah. I sat on a bus with Rainus in the early 90s. Oh, he told me his idea was to detect the neutrino from nuclear detonation. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, it was Fermi who said to do it from the reactor so he could repeat the experiment. Oh, I see. It's the Fermi <laughs> that say that. I see. I see. Yeah, so the reason why I say this is also make an analogy. I forgot to say it. It's we have also this crazy idea to put this uh, atomic clock on Parker Solar Probe. It, it might not work. But hopefully people here are smarter. You can come up with a more realistic idea that we can probe ultralight dark matter. So the crazy idea like using a using a atomic bomb is kind of stupid, but it motivates better idea from Fermi. So I think these are important lessons that we learn. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Question. Actually, uh you still have a hole that magnitude uh, gap, right? right. And then how precisely the, should the mass of this, you know, small bodies be, be determined to overcome their, you know, the gap? I mean, the should be determined the mass within the percent? I am not sure. That's a great question. Uh, so, yeah. So, for example, once you start to detect, once you want to determine the mass in the very Procedure that probably you also need to worry about the solar wind, right? It's kind of you know. Uh, also, you also have some perturbation from solar wind or something like that, right? That's a great question. So I didn't. I, that's something I plan to mention, but I didn't have time. So if you go down, let's say if you use Mars and you keep going down, the first thing you hit is solar wind before you hit dark matter. So you have a solar wind floor, if you want to call it like that. So because solar wind, but solar wind is dropping in terms of uh, R to the minus two. So solar wind will drop. So that also motivates us to study uh, asteroids that are further away. Because further away, there's less solar wind. Yeah. OK. Do you think that it's possible to draw the kind of the solar wind floor? Yes, you can do that. Yeah, yeah I mean, this is well done. I just haven't done it. Yeah, oh. I, just, I just don't want to complicate the plot. But yes, there is a solar wind. It's, looking, it's actually looking exactly like this. So since, interestingly, at Saturn place, the solar wind is comparable to dark matter. I like dark matter. It's an interesting coincidence. Maybe there's a problem. Then the unit is dark. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> we can, yeah. So, yeah. How, how, how precise? From, so, yeah, central. <laughs> so then how precise should we know the small body mass? 
you see, but in this case, you should, should know the amount of the smart bodies in the great precision and the above the, you know, stars, the whole Saturn radius, right? The beyond the Saturn radius. Yeah, but that's a good question. The minor body perturbation is most important for Bangalore and Apophis. Okay. So if you go further away, they're not that important anymore. And also, they are not that work bad for the the Saturn or Jupiter because those are heavier. The effect on them is smaller. So for Jupiter and Mars, really, what you really want is first increase the precision. I didn't have time to talk about this, but first is you want to increase the precision. But one thing I want to mention is okay. to analyze the planet is very tough because planets are heavy; they will have back reaction. So you have to fit the whole ephemerides again from the get-go. So hopefully the first thing we should do is increase the precision and then we convince the people who actually do the uh, planetary study to improve that because that's very much, that's much tougher than just doing asteroids. Going yeah. further and uh, you know, the increasing the precision is actually the... Yeah, the way to go. Yeah, not much further, but a little bit further, like a, a little bit above 10 AU would be the, the way to go. And another thing while going further is great is because again, it, you're not by proportional to a to the third. So you already see the benefit, right? So Mars is actually tracked much better than Saturn, but their constraints are comparable. Actually, Saturn is slightly better because of this a to the third vector. So going further away actually could be good. Thanks for the question. Yeah. Thanks for mentioning about Pluto. Yeah, Pluto should be very interesting. I haven't studied it, but and also it has its centricity, so we have larger coverage. Other questions? Okay. I have a very nice question. Like uh, for the sun, this boson star, like boson halo uh, thing, uh, would you not have like a boson halo on Earth? Uh, yes, uh, people always thought about that. That's even more crazy, right? Anything would disrupt them, right? Any Earth activity would disrupt, disrupt them. And yeah, I there are people actually study this. Earth the solar stuff. activity does not. I mean, there's so many things can this. I don't trust any of this model, but there are pe people study the, the Earth's halo. And even in our paper, I think we included a section talking about the Earth halo. So there are people actually did study that. But to me, how do you form this, right? What's the formation mechanism? To me, it's not clear. Do you form with the dust? It's hard to form. The sun you know, sun is easier to imagine because the sun is the first one to form. So you have a long history, you collect this thing, and then you form this thing, uh, this uh, solar halo. But for the Earth, isn't it just start with dust? I, I don't know how Earth forms. So if we found out how Earth forms, well, we can talk about it. Yeah. But, but people did study that, and we have that in our paper, actually. Yeah. OK, so the thank you again. Thank you very much.